Let's pray together. Father, we do thank You for the great High Priest that Christ is. And we are so grateful today that for those, that Christ came 2,000 years ago to um, become a man and to live among us. And we pray, Father, that today, as Enrique preaches Your Word, we pray today that... Um, our hearts and minds would be warmed and encouraged and challenged to view Christ in a manner perhaps that we haven't, we haven't uh, viewed Him in a long time as one who is our intercessor and one who, who, is, who can empathize with us as no one else can. And I, I pray, Lord, that You would teach us in a fresh way how to do that. Um, how to think of Jesus in that way, and that it would be an encouragement to us as your people. And Lord, we have many things on our hearts this morning, things that we at would ask prayer for. And Lord, one of those things is um, Sharon, who is uh, Roberta Kilcup's sister-in-law. Uh, she had she underwent cardiac cardiac arrest uh, this past week, and. Um, and is in the hospital now, and uh, Lord um, is going to—they're going to have some stents put in, Lord, soon. And we thank you that she does know you, uh, but she's in critical condition. And so we ask, Lord, that you would—that um, you would heal her, uh, that you would uh, use this in the lives of family members and to, to and in her in her own life to draw her to yourself even closer and uh, I pray Lord that you would just to take what is a difficult situation and a hard situation and use it for your purposes and for your glory and uh, Lord we would pray for her healing and that the stents that are being going to be put in would be uh, successful and so we do ask for that today Lord, we do continue to pray for others as well. My sister is back in the hospital. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, she would not uh, be there long and uh, that she'd be able to uh, uh, deal with the problem that she's having, but then uh, be able to continue to recover. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with others. We, we, we just pray this time of year uh, that is often a hard time of year um, as family members are missed and... Um, and that kind of thing, Lord. I pray that you would work in our lives and encourage us and that we would really see Christ as our hope. Um, and uh, even as we go through the season and rub shoulders, some at least with unsafe people, that they would view us and the hope that we have within us uh, despite difficult things that are going on in our world, in our country. We, think, we really think of our country and we think of our world and the turmoil that it is in. There is, there is no question, even without the Bible, we can see that we live in a fallen world. We, we, we experience it every day. We experience the corruption of a fallen world. We experience the, diff, the problems of a fallen world. We, we experience the sin of a fallen world. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to shine as lights in a dark world. And I thank you that you've given us the strength to be able to do that as we access your throne of grace. And we pray today, Lord, as we look at your word in, this, in these areas, that it would encourage us and challenge us and use it. Be with Enrique as he preaches that he would be uh, clear and that our hearts and minds would be receptive to it. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you take your Bibles now and turn to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, we are going to be uh, looking today at uh, and Enrique will be preaching for us from this passage, and the text will be verses 14 through 16. We'll read that now, and then Enrique will come up and preach for us. Verse 14 says this, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly in the throne of grace, 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is God's word. This is the fun part right here. Okay. Try to take the mask off without taking the whole mic off. That's tough. Well, I'm really excited to be able to uh, present this passage to us this morning. Um, this really is uh, stems from a question that I got at the ordination council and uh, some of the things that were said there, and it really caused me to want to study this a little more. And um, this is part of the product of that study, this message that we're going to look at today, this passage. Um, as many young people do when, uh, when you're, oh, I don't know, probably, I think prime time is probably 8 years old to 12 years old, maybe a little older than that too. Every tree becomes a viable climbing tree. Is that not the case? And such was the case when I was a young, younger person. Every tree was a potential climbing tree. Um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time up in the air. And um, uh, even sometimes pretty high. I don't know if you're familiar with the Revere Beach Library, but there are pine trees that surround that library. And I would go to the top of a couple of them. And um, sorry to my mother if she's listening to this. I don't think I ever told her that. Um, <laughs> there was this one group of trees that were a little more difficult because there weren't too many low branches. And they were very open, but me and my friend, we, we loved climbing those trees. It got so bad, though, that although it was public property, some of the neighbors decided to cut those lower branches. <laughs> that didn't stop us. <laughs> that didn't stop us at all. We, we, we found another way to shimmy up and get up there anyway. But it was on that clump of tree that I probably had my, my biggest scare. I was holding with one hand at one point, and I wanted to get to uh, another set of branches, and my feet slipped. And I was, for a moment, holding with just one hand, and the rest of me was dangling. And I was, I was definitely scared, but thankfully I did have a very firm hold on that branch. And as my momentum carried me back, I was able to place my feet back on the branch that I was there. But I was, I, you know, I was maybe 15, 20 feet up, so may, it might not have killed me if I had fallen, but I probably would have gotten hurt. I'm sure, but I was clinging like my life depended on it. What do we cling to as if our lives depend on it? What are we willing to let go of? Conversely, what do we just maintain a, a loose grip on because perhaps of just apathy? In this Christian life, we may have, we face a lot of different things. We, we may have doubts concerning our beliefs, we may have doubts whether following God is really worth it. We might feel very lonely in our Christian walk at times. We might just feel like we're failures, that we just continually fail every day. We might feel run down. We were out of gas. We don't have enough to give on a daily basis. We might feel like God is silent or, and or he's, he's really not working on our behalf. We don't see him helping us. All of these considerations, and more, I'm sure, can cause us to lose our grip on our profession of faith. You ask, is that really what this is about? Actually, yes. You're in Hebrews, and the book of Hebrews was written to Jews who were on the brink, or at least considering, turning their back on Christ and reverting back to Judaism. Why? Well, to be a Jew at that time, to be a follower of God in Judaism, there warranted no persecution. But to be a Jewish believer, a follower of Christ, meant persecution. The hearers of the message of the book of Hebrews were enduring persecution. And that is why you find several warning passages in this book. There are some difficult sections in this book, no doubt. But they're about persevering in the faith, not falling away from Christ. It is in this context that we have this or exhortation in verse 14 where it says, Let us 
hold fast our confession. The author of Hebrews wants us to hold fast to our confession. What do we cling to as if our lives depended on it? Well, our physical lives might not be at stake when we look at our spiritual walks, but in view of this passage, our spiritual walks definitely are at stake, and our spiritual lives might be as well. The stakes, my friends, are high. They really are. The author of Hebrews knows this, and he has this message for God's people. Hold fast to our confession of faith. Why? Well, the passage that we're looking at today will give us three reasons why we must cling and why we, must, we are able, actually, to even cling to our profession of faith. But I mentioned a couple times, but just to make sure that we understand what is it that we are holding fast to. It says our confession in the passage. What does this mean? Have you ever had, uh, many of you work with tools, some of you maybe don't work with tools as much, but there's a particular tool that is one of my favorite tools. Many of you know I do side work, and sometimes when I'm in a jam and I can't get something loose or I need extra grip, more grip than what a pair of pliers or channel locks can do, you know what I go to? Vice grips. <laughs> I love me a good pair of vice grips. There they are. Oh, they warm my heart. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Pat, for that, for that conglomeration there. That's not, that was not my ingenuity. There. That was all Pat there putting them up there like that. Vice grips. You see the knob on the end. Well, if you have a particular thing that you want to grip, you, you twist that knob out or in, depending on where you need to go, and it will clamp on that thing. And I don't know what kind of force it, it has pounds wise, but it has a lot of force. And let me tell you, you're going to struggle if you're going to, if you want to try and get that thing to lose its grip. It holds on tight. That's the type of grip that we're talking about in a loose sense as every illustration breaks down. But it's the idea of holding on to something with no intention of letting go. Holding fast. That's the idea a vice grip that will not let go. What are we to put these spiritual vice grips on? Our text says that it is our confession, or in other words, our profession of faith. We're supposed to put these spiritual vice grips on our profession of faith. This might seem like a strange thing to cling to, but remember, these are Christians or these are Jewish people flirting with the idea of defecting from following Christ. And that is the worst case scenario, worst case scenario that we're dealing with here. So what, is, what are we talking about when we're talking about our confession or our profession of faith? Well, it's, it's really three elements. It's the truth of the gospel. We're supposed to be clinging to that we're saved by the blood of the Lamb and nothing can separate us from that. Also included with that is the fact of my position in Jesus. I am viewed with a righteousness that is not my own. Righteousness has been placed on my account, and that's how God views me through Christ. And then also, it's the future hope that we have when our faith is realized. What are we talking about? Well, that, it's that salvation is not fully realized yet. There is a future glorification that we will yet receive, and a future home in heaven. We have a lot to look forward to. That is the profession of faith, what we are clinging to. We're clinging to those things. But why can we do this? Why are we able to do this? And that's where we get into the, the main points of the message here. We can, first of all, we can hold fast to our confession because we have a great high priest. We see this in verse 14. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. First reason is that because we have a great high priest. What is the significance of calling Jesus a great high priest? Well, in, in context, in greater context in the book of Hebrews, the author is in 
and over and over again, showing how Christ is better or superior to something else. He's already uh, looked and shown that he's superior than angels. He's shown that he's better than the prophets. He's shown that he's superior to Moses and Joshua. And now he is showing that he is better or superior to the Old Testament priesthood. It is because he is this great high priest that we can hold fast to our profession of faith. We see here that there's a few elements here. He, he has passed through the heavens, and he, has, he is the Son of God. He's the high priest who has passed through the heavens, and he is the Son of God in this, in this verse. As the Son of God, he is the ultimate revelation of God. And the one in whom God's purposes for the universe are completed. That is the position, the rank, if you will, of the Son of God. And as the ultimate high priest, it talks about him being the great high priest. There is, to my knowledge, there's no other person given this particular title. Yes, there were high priests in the Old Testament, but none were told, were, are we told that they are great. He is this great high priest. He was faithful to God in the face of suffering and temptation, enduring death to make atonement for the sins of people. And in his ascension, he passed through the heavens and went into God's presence to appear for us as our representative. In Hebrews 9.24, it says, For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us or on our behalf. Some of the imagery here is important for us in, in comparison of Jesus to the former priesthood. On the annual day of atonement we find in Leviticus 16, the Jewish high priests offered sacrifices outside the tabernacle or temple and then entered the inner tent or the sanctuary to intercede for the people on the basis of the offerings that they had made. And in many passages, uh, different passages, Hebrews suggests the fulfillment of this ritual, that's Old Testament ritual, the fulfillment is found in the death of Jesus, his ascension into heaven, and the work that he now has at the right hand of God as our interce intercessor or as our mediator. We see it in Hebrews 7 as well, in verse 25, where it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Talking about Jesus there. The priests, they do it over and over and over again for their own sins and for the sins of the people. Jesus, he did it once when he offered up himself. In verse 28, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. And then in Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Being a priest in the Old Testament meant that you were a mediator between God and the people. You offered sacrifices of bulls and goats to cover the sins of, pe of the people. But no priest ever sacrificed himself. Jesus is the ultimate mediator, sacrificing himself once for everyone, actually paying the punishment for sin, not just covering it, but removing the sin of the believer. This, this is our Savior. He is the ultimate mediator, mediator between God and mankind because through his completely sufficient sacrifice, 
we have been granted access to God. This makes him our great high priest. We cling to our profession of faith because this is our great high priest who has given us what we could never attain ourselves, removal of sins and access to God. He is our advocate interceding on our behalf. Who wouldn't want to cling to that Savior? We cling to our profession of faith because of our great high priest and who he is and what he has done on our behalf. But the next reason to place our spiritual vice grips on the faith we profess is because he can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. We can hold fast to our confession because he sympathizes with our weaknesses. In verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is a rather surprising statement when you think about it, when you stop and think about it for a moment, because we have just seen our Savior in the previous verse elevated above all, right? I mean, you would think such a great high priest who has done what nobody else could do for you and I, we would almost see him as a little bit distant, as a little bit far off, as unrelatable. But lest we think that he is so far above us that he can't relate to us at all, think again. It says that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. One commentator said it this way. The preceding verse might suggest the remoteness of Jesus from the struggles of his people on earth. But our heavenly high priest is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. The, our Lord's appreciation of our infirmities, of our weaknesses, is an experiential one based on the fact that he was tempted like we are. You might think, but, but Jesus was sinless. I mean, how can he really relate? I mean, he, he never sinned. We, we sin every day. How, how does this work exactly? And full disclosure, this is a bit of a mystery. <laughs> there is some struggle with us comprehending this, but I think there is some help in this passage that, that we can gather in understanding this. He can sympathize with us as sinners. Honestly, his understanding of us is, is even heightened because of the temptation that he had to endure. We are weak, right? When we, when we are faced with temptation, we can have struggles um, and we might resist temptation for a little bit, but if the temptation is particularly strong and we are weak in regards to that temptation, what's eventually going to happen? We likely are going to give in to it. Now, maybe this is over a period of seconds, or maybe it's minutes or hours, whatever the temptation might be. But how long do you think we can actually endure a temptation. Like if, if the devil is really on us and tempting us on a particular area of weakness, how much temptation can we handle? Of the full onslaught of what the devil could, could bring at us, what, 10%? 15%? Maybe 50% on a good day of the temptation that we could handle until we give in? What does that mean for when Jesus endured temptation? He never gave in, right? He was sinless. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That means that whatever temptations he felt and endured, he endured the entire onslaught of the temptation. He saw 100% of the temptation and yet resisted and maintained his sinlessness. So he, in all points, is tempted as we are, yet without sin. We, it's safe to say, I think, according to the way we look at this verse, we're not actually tempted at all points because we give in too soon. 
because of our weakness. But Jesus endured it all over and over again while he was on earth and yet remained sinless. He therefore experimentally and experientially knows what power is needed to overcome temptations. And he is capable of sympathizing with us. He was at the same time tempted, and I would suggest that he was tempted without sin, yet truly tempted. It may be argued, and has been at times from, from different people, that the only one who can fully res- that, that sorry, the only one who fully resists temptation can know the extent, the full extent of its force. Thus, the sinless one, our sinless Savior, has a greater capacity for compassion than any other sinner could have for a fellow sinner. What does this mean for us? How does this, how does this really apply to us? Many of you know that, that I run on a regular basis. I did my first... Um, organized run back in August and I still want to keep it up because I'd like to do that do that run again and try and beat my time next year if as long as Lord willing as, as long as they do it again <laughs> and um, I was running on Friday and uh, due to some circumstances I, I actually ran a, a different I've never run before but it's a place where I've ridden my bike by and I've, I've driven by I don't know how many times and I came across this cemetery, and this cemetery, um, it, it's one that I've seen before. I know it's, it's attached to this, uh, this church across the way. And I knew the church was old. Uh, I've read about it in, in a book or two, uh, that it's been around for a long time. So I did figure that the cemetery was old, but I didn't know how old. And let me tell you, I didn't look at every gravestone, but every uh, death year was before 1900. And you know, for me, that's, I, I don't know, I kind of geek out about it a little bit um, when, when I look at all that kind of stuff. And, but there was one that caught my eye. And it, it, it really did impact me because I saw, I saw the, the death date first. I saw the year 1894. And I saw the birth year. And it was 1890. And I looked up and I saw, our, it said, our darling Albert. And um, it, you know, it, it, it hit me. You know, I mean, on this run, I wasn't planning on dealing with any of this, but it, it hit me. And then, and I looked at the inscription underneath, and it, it, I don't have the, I don't have it memorized, but it said something to the effect of, uh, "They will be in the care of the Most High," capital M, capital H. Now I have no idea if, if these people were, were saved. I don't I don't know any of that. But but what I do know is that at least according to what they had, what they paid f- to be etched onto that tombstone, they believed that God would take care of their child. They were trusting in the fact that that was the case. You know, I I have a four year old. I can't imagine the suffering, the, the, the type of loss that someone would feel. I hope I never have to feel that kind of loss. But meanwhile, I'm meditating on this passage, and you know what I think to myself? I think Jesus knows that kind of loss. And he's faced every temptation that goes along with suffering a loss like that. That's what it means when we see that God, that Jesus, sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. They all find themselves in the care of the Most High. What will we focus on when we go through, as we'll see in a moment, our times of need? Do we feel alone in our battles in this life? Does it seem like no matter how many times you explain it, nor how many ways you explain it, no one seems to understand what you are feeling or what you're going through. Know this, Jesus does. According to this verse, Jesus knows, and he knows better than anyone else. He has experienced all the scenarios of life and come through them sinless. 
we can hold fast. We can cling to our profession of faith because we have a Savior who knows exactly what we are going through every moment of every day. Not only are we able to cling to our profession of faith because we have a great high priest, not only is it because we have a Savior who is uniquely acquainted with our weaknesses, but also because we have complete access to the throne of God because of Him. So thirdly, our third main point this morning is we can hold fast to our confession because we have access to the throne of grace. Let's look at verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It says here we can boldly draw near to God. We can continually draw near to the throne. The throne of grace. For us, God's throne The place where he sits has become a throne of of grace through the mediation of our great high priest who is at God's right hand. We will always find God on the throne of grace. You know, the throne God or the throne room of God is often portrayed in light of judgment and wrath in Scripture. You can probably think of a couple of passages that that talk about that. But for the believer, it is none of that. We have access to the God of the universe. This phrase, throne of grace, reminds us that God is on the throne, and He is completely sovereign. But listen to this. We won't find a God there who scowls at us, or is bothered by us, or frustrated at us, No, with him, we will find grace and benevolence. That is what God's throne is to us. But why would we want to draw near to God? Why would we want to go boldly in an open fashion? So the idea here is that we are able to have complete access to God because of Jesus Being our mediator, he has granted us access to God. Why would we want to do this? Well, the verse tells us. We see it here. And oh, how we need these things that are mentioned here. It says that we can obtain mercy or receive mercy. Mercy or compassion. It's it's, it's that idea that because we have a high priest that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, he knows what we're going through, he is ready to bestow upon us the mercy that we need. You know, when we are falling often in temptation, are we not? And we, we, there's guilt that's associated with that, and there's uh, frustration that's associated with that, but what do we need most of all? Well, we need mercy. It's when we get mercy, God is withholding from us what we rightfully deserve. And in there it says in this verse also that we might receive mercy and find grace. Corresponding is, is corresponding here to the title that's given of the throne, the throne of grace. We see then that in grace, he has given us what we do not deserve, or he is giving us what we don't deserve. In receiving mercy and finding grace, we are reminded of the fact that when we are following Christ, we don't, with a burden that we share is not a heavy burden. What does Christ say about his yoke or his burden? That it is light. That in him we can actually have rest, and rest is actually talked about in this passage earlier in in Hebrews 4. But with him, there isn't this weight and this burden that is crushing us. Sometimes we have that, but it's because we put that on ourselves. With Christ's burden, with Christ's yoke, it's light. It is bearable. It is carryable. And he gives us the grace and the mercy to hold it. 
And what does it say here also in this verse? It says that we have access to both of these, both mercy and grace, when? In our time of need. In our times of need. You know, there are, we don't necessarily need all the grace and all the mercy all the time, but God does know when we need grace and mercy. And in those times of need, it says, in those seasons of need, we have access to both grace and mercy. A supply of grace is in store for believers against all, uh, all scenarios of life. But they are only supplied, the mercy and grace is only supplied according to the need when it arises. With such a high priest, with such a great high priest, who sympathizes with us, understanding our weaknesses like no other could, believers should and can approach the throne of grace with confidence to seek out that mercy and grace that he is ready to bestow on us. We as Christians can expect fully to receive mercy and find grace to help in our times of need. Whatever situations we find ourselves in, we have access to the throne of grace. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that it isn't a throne of judgment for us, or a throne of ridicule, or a throne of cruelty, or a throne of abandonment? That isn't who our God is. It is true and understandable. We all have times of struggle. But in that time of struggle, in those times of need, we must cling to our profession of faith with our vice grips, our spiritual vice grips, with the intention of never, ever letting go. Never let go of the truth of the gospel. Never forget of our position in Christ. Never forget that future hope that we have. And as we wrap this up, and as I've looked at this and I see this in my own life, I believe sometimes we do not utilize all that is available to us when we find ourselves in times of need. We replace our high priest with, great, with, with worldly wisdom or our own wisdom and we falter. We replace our high priest with remaining in our lonely state and we lose heart. We don't look to find mercy or grace when it's available to us. We instead go to other resources, methods of escape or forgetting our problems. We look to, we, we, we go farther for, from God rather than going closer to Him. Ultimately, my friends, there is great help for the believer if we would just remember these three reasons from this passage that we can cling to our profession of faith. And as we, as we wrap this up, let's just go over these last few again one more time. Don't forget who Jesus is. He is our great high priest. We have been given access to God through him. He is the mediator between God and mankind. All this is done by him. None of this could have been accomplished without him. Second, closing application, Jesus knows you and the scenarios of life that you face better than anyone else. Even when no one else perhaps understands, he knows what you're going through. He is uniquely qualified to know what you're going through. And because of that, because of that access that we get through him, we have obtained access to the throne of grace where we can find grace and receive mercy. It is through Jesus that we have been granted this access. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. This is why we can hold fast and cling to our profession of faith. Let's pray. Father, these truths from your word are truly astounding. And it, some of it even boggles our minds and, and causes us to just stand back in awe. But Lord, I pray that we would not be a people that ignores 
the truths found in these verses. We need you as our high priest. We need you to understand what we're going through. And we need grace and mercy in our times of, in, of need. And I pray, Lord, that we would not forget, that we would remember that we have access to all of these things and more in our times of need. Help us to resist the temptation to go other places, inferior places, for our help. Let us run to you and cling to you. Help us, Lord, to put our spiritual vice grips on our profession of faith, the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.